Hello, welcome to PC Jack. Today we're going to be doing a little overview of the MSI Mag Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4's BIOS. If you're not familiar with the MSI BIOS, then this may be a nice way for you to get more familiarised with the actual layout of the BIOS and some of the features that you will have. Some of these features will be in particular to Z690, but there are some features of the MSI BIOS which will also translate to other platforms as well. So jumping right in, this is the advanced section of the BIOS. Now you may want to go for the easy mode section which will be a little less cluttered, so we can take a look at that first. So as you can see, we've got a couple of basic things displayed on here. We've got some temperatures like our CPU and motherboard, along with our V-Core and DDR voltage. And we've also got our BIOS mode, so we can see we're currently in UEFI BIOS mode, which is totally normal. And then we've got, obviously got our date and time, and uh, more importantly, we've got our CPU speed, which is just running at stock now for our Core i5-12600K. And then for our DDR speed, that is for our memory, which is currently running at its rated XMP speeds, which is 3600 MHz. One of the other important things to be able to find in the BIOS is obviously going to be the actual BIOS version you're currently running. And that is actually displayed here, because you can see we're currently running E7D32IMS.100. Now when you first boot your system up, it's going to be a good idea to actually go through and do a little reality check and make sure everything is looking up to scratch. So one of the things you would need to be taking a look for is obviously if your memory is being detected correctly. And you can find this here. So as we can see here, we've got both of our sticks of Crucial Ballistics being detected. We're running 2 by 8 gigabytes of Crucial Ballistics memory, and as you can see, they are both showing in both slots on this system. Now, you may see this as a lower DRAM frequency, but it's only because I've already enabled XMP, which is why it's showing 3600. But I will show you where you would have to select XMP in the advanced section if you're curious. Now, another thing you'd want to be checking when you're in the BIOS is obviously to make sure your storage devices are also picked up as well. In the storage section, you can see that we're currently in AHCI mode, but we can also see that our 250GB M.2 drive is also being picked up. Now, say you had any other devices connected, like a 3.5-inch mechanical drive, that would come up under one of these SATA ports on this section. Under the Easy Mode section, you'll also find information for your fan configurations. Now, I do like to actually do these in the advanced section and configure them precisely to how I'd want them to be set up, so I'll show you how to access that in just a second. Another set we've also got up here is our boot priority, which is going to be very important if you want to be able to actually boot into your Windows or any other OS. So you can actually select the boot priority in this easy mode section as well. Now, when it comes to anything in the BIOS, I do prefer to use the advanced mode as you do get a lot more features and settings that are going to be a lot more useful. So we're going to take a look through there. So starting off, we're going to take a look in our motherboard settings. Now, if we take a look under advanced, we have a couple of interesting features. For our PCIe settings, we've got a couple of interesting things, but most notably is going to be the feature resizable bar support, which can increase your performance, so it is worth enabling that. Some of the other features that will be pretty useful in this settings page is also the secure erase feature, which will allow you to completely wipe any SSDs that are installed. So it may be pretty useful if you have an old SSD that you want to start fresh, or maybe you just want to sell that SSD and make sure it's securely erased and there's no data left over on it, so you can use secure erase for that. Moving on to boot, again this is where we can enable a couple of different features when it comes to our bootloader. And some of the things I would advise disabling are your fast boot options because they really aren't necessary and can cause some issues for your OS. So I would just disable those if you get around to it. But this is where you can also select your boot order. So as you can see we don't have any bootable devices at the moment and that's only because I've wiped the OS on this so there's nothing to actually boot off of at the moment. But if you had a USB drive with your Windows installation on it, then you'll be able to select it in this boot option setting and enable that to actually run off when you exit the BIOS. Now for Z690, it's not going to be too relevant because it's probably going to be enabled out of the box, but you can use the security tab to actually go through and change your TPM settings. Now, it may be that you need to enable it on a different platform, but for Z690, it's configured out of the box to boot with TPM enabled. Now, moving on to a bit more of an advanced section of our BIOS, we're going to take a look at what our overclocking settings look like. Now, we're currently in the Expert Explorer mode, just so we can see all the settings we'd like to see. Now, there are an awful lot of settings in here that are going to affect the way you can configure the actual speeds of your CPU and your memory. But we're just going to glance over some of the more important stuff you would look at, say, if you were doing any overclocking, for example. So if we take a look at here, for our P-Core Ratio Apply mode, this is essentially deciding what ratio you're going to apply on what part of the CPU. So as you can see, we've got some different settings, like an all-core, so if you want to do an all-core overclock, or a turbo ratio, or per core overclocking. Now, p-core ratio is where you would actually enter the actual ratio you want to run for any sort of overclock. So say, for example, I wanted to run an overclock of 4.5 gigahertz. I would enter a ratio of 45. And as you can see, that has changed that to 4,500 megahertz or 4.5 gigahertz. 
and that would mean that is what the CPU would run at because we've set that as the p-core ratio. For now, I'm just going to change that back to auto though because we're not uh, doing any overclocking today. Now, you can do the exact same thing on the e-cores for your old lake system and it functions in the exact same way as p-core overclocking. So you could go in here and you could enter your overclock. Say we want to go for 3.8 gigahertz. So we could go in here and type in 38 and that has changed our e-core ratio to 3800 megahertz. Now, one of the more unusual features of Z690 that I've noticed is that it has this particular setting on here for CPU cooler tuning. So, if you take a look at it, we've basically got Boss Cooler essentially limits our power to 241 watts, or for Tower Air Cooler, we've got 288 watts, or Water Cooler, it limits us to 4096 watts. Now, you are never going to pull that much power. That is, in a sense, just a, an unlimited cap but you can just leave it as that if you are doing any overclocking in particular and don't want to be power limited, but you are not going to be hitting anywhere near that amount of power. Now, CPU base clock, this is something that's been quite noble lately when it comes to the actually non-overclocking systems like B660. A lot of people have been able to achieve overclocks on systems that aren't designed for overclocking by changing the BCLK for their CPU. So on here, you can enter 101. And as you can see, that'll change our multiplier differently based on what the overclock is going to be. So you can play around with it, but it's a little tricky, but just why I bring that up considering the attention it's been getting on non-overclocking systems like B660. Now, taking a look at our DRAM settings, this is where you would be able to enable XMP for your memory. So as you can see, we've already got it enabled, but out of the box, it will most likely be disabled. So you'd have to go in here and enable it in order to actually run the memory at the speed you want. So in this instance, our rated memory speed is 3600 megahertz. So as you can see, we are currently running at that. But you can also do this manually, but that is a lot more involved. So you probably would want to stick just to XMP and maybe look up a guide if you did want to get into any sort of memory overclocking to push past the rated speeds of the memory kit. Now under voltage settings, these are some of the settings that are going to be most useful for when you're overclocking. So in this instance, if you were doing a CPU overclock, you'd want to be adding a little bit more voltage. And you could change that by using any of these various modes. So typically I would use override mode for a CPU overclock. And then you'd be able to go into your CPU core voltage and set your own voltage. So as an example, we go for 1.25. And that is set in a core voltage of 1.25 volts for the overclock that we set up. Now what core voltage you can get away with will depend on the quality of your CPU. So it is a bit of trial and error, but generally you don't want to push too high on the voltage. So if you would start low, like something like 1.25 and work your way up, as long as you don't head pass around, I would say 1.35 volts, you should be okay. But it is going to depend, like I said. Now we do get multiple settings for our voltages, but the only other one I would pay particular attention to would be our DRAM voltage if we were doing any sort of DDR4 overclocking. But for now, you can just leave it as is if you're running XMP, as the voltages should be sufficient for that. Now one of the other sections I'd like to draw attention to would be the digital power section over here. And this is where it'll allow you to change your load line calibration settings. So if you're not familiar with load line calibration, it's fairly involved, but the basic idea of load line calibration is that when you are running your CPU at idle, you will often see the highest voltages when the CPU clocks are not really doing much at all. But as soon as you go into a more CPU intensive scenario, that voltage will shoot up and then drop to a more reasonable level where it will stay at. But the issue can be when you're overclocking, that shoot and drop in your CPU voltage can actually cause instability. So the idea of setting a low line calibration is that that what is referred to as V-droop is less catastrophic and will actually be more stable. So you have varying degrees of LLC depending on how aggressive you would like to go for it. But it will depend on the motherboard you have. But in this instance, mode one would be the most aggressive form of LLC. And then the further down you go, the less aggressive. So it can be useful for your overclocks depending on how aggressive you are looking to go. But I wouldn't go too high on LLC just to be safe. So there's multiple settings for overclocking, but they would be the ones I would generally pay the most attention to. Moving on, we've got M-Flash, which is what you would use if you want to update the BIOS for your motherboard. Now, I would only update your BIOS if you were encountering any difficulties with the current BIOS version you're using. Or maybe there's a feature on the latest BIOS that you need, but you don't have on the current one that you have. So you would go through there and go through the update process using that. But I would be very careful in the way you update it, because you can brick your motherboard if you do it incorrectly. If you are looking for a tutorial on how to update your motherboard's BIOS, then make sure to check out this video I did from a couple of months back. We've also got an uh, OC profile, so if you had any particular overclocks that you wanted to save, you could save them in this and then load the profile depending on which one you want to use. 
Lastly, we're going to take a look at hardware monitor and this is where you would be able to change your fan settings. So as you can see here, we're under the CPU one, which is the actual fan for the CPU cooler. And you can basically drag these and change them as much as you want. If you're at 60C, we could have it at 40% fan speed, or you can increase this up to 50 odd. So you can just try this out and see which fan curves work best for yourself. And you can do this for every single fan header on your system. So as you can see, we've only got a couple plugged in. So we've got system two, which is currently running, along with system four and system five. But you can change all of those fan speeds as much as you want. And that's about it. It's a very basic overlook of the MSI BIOS, but for a first time builder, they might be a little overwhelmed with all the options you have available to you. But hopefully going through some of the settings in today's video has made it a bit more clear on what settings you should change and some of the settings that are not necessary for you at this time. So that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more videos on the way soon. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at PCJack94. If you'd like to talk more with myself and other like-minded hardware enthusiasts, then make sure to check out the PCJack Discord. If you'd like to support the channel even further though, then make sure to check out the PCJack Patreon where you can claim exclusive benefits while helping to fund everything I do on the channel for you guys. You'll find links to all those in the video description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.